Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we're getting into the first Kings and Generals video we've done. We're going to start the series Winter War. The setup, let's get into it. The relationship between Russia and Finland was always tumultuous due to a variety of geographical, political and economic factors. Finland was a constant field of battle between Sweden and Russian entities. The Treaty of Nürtaboy of 1323, signed by Sweden and the Novgorod Republic, divided Karelia, the region populated by the balto finnic Karelians. As Sweden became more powerful over the next few centuries, it took over the rest of Finland and forced the Tsardom of Russia to cede more of South Karelia in 1617. However, fortunes would turn and by the end of the Great Northern War and the Russo-Swedish War in the first half of the 18th century, Sweden had given Karelia to Russia. The two empires continued to fight, and Russia, supported by Napoleonic France, won the Finnish War in 1809. As a result, Russia annexed Finland, which became the autonomous Grand Duchy of Finland, with its own laws and administration, and the Russian Emperor as its Duke. Previously, a Swedish general, Gustav Moritz Armfeldt, had become an influential counsellor for the Emperor Alexander I, and his influence was crucial in reuniting South Karelia with the duchy. The early period of liberal Russian rule in Finland gave way to a more autocratic approach over the second half of the 19th century, as Russian emperors made deliberate attempts to Russify the duchy. However, these methods only strengthened the national identity of the Finns, and the Fenomen movement underlined the yearning for independence. The autocratic policies of Nicholas II led to the assassination of his governor in Finland, which also joined the revolution of 1905 with a general strike. As a result, the autonomy of Finland was removed, and the Russification intensified. In November 1914, an underground student movement started plotting to gain independence, and was supported by Germany. To weaken Russia, the German Empire trained groups of Finns as Jaegers, elite light infantry. In February of 1917, Russia was rocked by a revolution. The Russian provincial government returned autonomous rights to the Finns. However, the internal situation in Finland wasn't great. Both left- and right-wing parties vied for power, creating security forces known as the Red Guard and White Guard, respectively. After the Bolsheviks took over the Russian government in November, all sides of the political spectrum in Finland were eager to declare independence from Russia, and they did just that on December 6th. The Bolsheviks were not strong enough to prevent this, and by the end of the year, Lenin's government recognized Finland's independence. The latter hoped that the Red Guard would make Finland communist and they would rejoin Russia down the line. With Germany and Sweden supporting the White Guard and the Bolsheviks supporting the Red Guard, Finland entered a period of civil war in January 1918. But this is not just Finland. Um, there are a lot of countries that are surrounding essentially what will become like the Eastern Bloc countries. Um, they're not all Eastern Bloc countries later on, but this is happening with a lot of the countries surrounding Russia and then the Soviet Union. And then it happens again with the fall of the Soviet Union where there's this push and pull where you have the people, the natives of these countries want uh, more or less they want to be independent. Now, there are groups within the country that don't, but overall, the majority of the civilian population wants to be independent. Russia is funding groups and, and some of these militant groups to persuade, force, coerce, um, if not an outright like annexation into Russian territory, at least to become... Uh, communist and more or less a Russian puppet. Um, so it's not just Finland that this is happening to. There are a whole string of countries. Um, Czechoslovakia has a, a big back and forth here. Um, Latvia has their own. Um, but so this is this is common, and it's less common 
when the Soviet Union just says, okay, you can have your independence, we'll recognize that Finland is an independent country, that is the less common thing of everything that's happening here. But that disassociation, the ability of Finland to create and you know be acknowledged as its own independent state is what is going to set up this clash. Both sides had around 100,000 troops, but the Whites had former officers of the Russian army and Jaegers fighting for them, and they were led by a talented former general of the Russian army, Karl Gustav Emil Mannerheim. This, and the fact that the Germans occupied Red-controlled Helsinki in April 1918, allowed the Whites to win the civil war in May 1918. 40,000 Finns died in this war. To appease Germany, Finland elected Prince Frederick Charles of Hesse as a king, but even before he arrived, he abdicated due to the revolution in Germany, so the Finns opted for a presidential republic. Finnish nationalists wanted to take over Karelia, and three volunteer expeditions attempted to take the region in 1918 and 1919, all of which failed. Simultaneously, Finnish volunteers participated in the Estonian Liberation War, helping the country to gain independence from the Soviets. At this point, Menahem created a plan to occupy the capital of Russia, Petrograd, modern St. Petersburg, but the government rejected the proposal. Finally, Finland and Soviet Russia signed the Treaty of Tartu in 1920, establishing new borders, with Finland gaining Petsamo and access to the Arctic Ocean, while ceding Repola and Poryayabi. In 1921, Karelia started a rebellion against the Bolsheviks and was supported by Finnish volunteers. This territory was crucial for the Soviets, as the Murmansk Petrograd Railway was in the region and they moved overwhelming forces to Karelia to secure it. Despite some early success, this uprising was crushed in early 1922. In the same year, the Russian Civil War was concluded, and the victorious Union of Soviet Socialist Republics became too strong for Finland to continue these expeditions. Over the next decade, Finland put its faith in the League of Nations, and then its declared neutrality. Simultaneously, Finland enacted a mandatory military training program, and by 1939, more than 180,000 soldiers and officers took part in it. Finland also started building a defensive line from the Gulf of Finland to Lake Ladoga, predicting that the region of the Karelian Isthmus would be the central area of attack of the Soviet forces in a possible war. The chain of fortifications, called the Manaheim Line after the leader of the Finnish troops, was 150 kilometers long and was built between 1920 to 1924 and 1932 to 1939. And keep this in mind, the Mannerheim line is a defensive line that's going to be very, very important for the upcoming clash. Um, this is where the Finns are going to demolish a lot, a lot of Soviet troops. It integrated various smaller lakes and swamps along its frontier. Stalin, who became the Soviet leader at the end of the 20s, considered Finland to be a threat. He wasn't sure that the Finns wouldn't support Germany and allow its troops to attack the USSR through Finland. At the same time, the proximity of the Finnish borders to St. Petersburg, then called Leningrad, and to the Murmansk-Leningrad Railway was making the Treaty of Tartu tenuous at best. According to the sources, the Soviet Red Army started building railway tracks towards the Finnish border sometime in 1935, planning to use them in a possible invasion. In 1938 and 1939, Soviet diplomats approached the Finns, asking for a new treaty with guarantees that in case of a German invasion, Finland would fight against it and even allow the Soviets to enter the country and join its defense. Stalin was still reorganizing his army after the Great Purge of 1936 to 1938. Yeah, reorganizing is a very uh, nice way of putting it. Stalin killed basically all of the leaders of his army and then had to rebuild it from scratch in a hurry. In, in a hurry. Um, and in fact, 
nobody in the outside world really knows how bad the Soviet military has gotten after the purge until this, you know, planned invasion of Finland starts. And that is what really opens, you know, the, the world's eyes to what Stalin has done to his military. So he started to look for allies, but was firmly rejected by France and the United Kingdom. As a result, Stalin turned to Hitler and signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact with Germany. Officially, this was a non-aggression pact, but its secret clauses divided Eastern Europe into spheres of influence, with the USSR getting Finland, Estonia, Latvia and Eastern Poland. Worried, the Finns attempted to create a Scandinavian alliance, hopeful that a sizable Swedish army would serve as a deterrent. However, this hope was crushed when Sweden caved in to the German and Soviet demands. On the 1st of September 1939, Germany invaded Poland and started World War II. In response, the British and French declared war on Hitler. In mid-September, the Soviets invaded Poland from the east. Soon Poland was occupied entirely, despite staunch resistance, its territory divided between the Nazis and the USSR. Stalin immediately demanded that the Baltic countries grant his forces military access, and the latter agreed, allowing almost 80,000 Soviet troops to set up bases. In response, Finland intensified the building of the Mannerheim Line, adding 150 concrete bunkers in short order. On the 5th of October 1939, Stalin summoned a Finnish delegation to Moscow. The Soviets demanded the border along the Karelian Isthmus be moved to the northwest, away from Leningrad. They also demanded the islands in the Gulf of Finland and the Kalasta Yansarento Peninsula, the establishment of a Soviet military base on the Hanko Peninsula, and the destruction of all fortifications on the Karelian Isthmus. In return, Finland would have received Repola and Poyayabi. Simultaneously, both sides started mobilizing their forces under the guise of training, and the Finns began evacuating civilians from the Karelian Isthmus and the cities along the Baltic coast. Even though Hermann Goering approached the Finnish government and asked them to agree to these demands, the Finns attempted to negotiate, giving their counteroffer and receiving another Soviet demand, which they re So, what the Soviets are trying to do here is... They're trying to essentially put distance between them and where they think the Germans would attack from if they moved through Finland, right? But on the Finnish side of this, if you, have, if you see the way that the Soviet Union is acting in all of these other countries in the area, then you know that agreeing to these demands is essentially giving up your sovereignty to Russia. If you're going to allow them to have, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of troops in country, if you're going to allow them to set up military bases, um, dictate where the lines, where the border is, you are essentially giving up your sovereignty to the Soviet Union. And so Finland basically just decides like, no, we're not going to do that. The Soviet Union has already decided like, this is an ultimatum. And the Finns, they, they think that that's what this is. They, so both sides are kind of, I won't say like they're bad faith acting here, but both sides in the negotiations kind of see the direction that this is heading. And so as they continue to talk behind the scenes, armies are moving, you know, all of the preparations for war are being made on both sides responded to with another counteroffer. On the 13th of November, the negotiations broke down. On the 26th of November, a Soviet border post was attacked in an incident later known as the shelling of Manila. The Soviets immediately claimed that it was a Finnish attack and demanded they move their forces away from the border. Finland denied this and called for an independent commission to investigate the event. Modern sources have confirmed that it was a false flag operation conducted by the USSR to implicate the Finns. On the 29th of November, the Soviets broke diplomatic relations with Finland and one day later renounced the non-aggression pact between their two countries. The Winter War had begun. 
the leader of the Soviet army in the region, was a veteran of the Spanish Civil War, commander of the Leningrad military district, Meretskov, who had four well-equipped armies at his disposal. The 7th Army under Yakovlev had nine infantry divisions, plus one tank and four armoured brigades. It was tasked with taking over the Karelian Isthmus and the city of Vipuri, and then pushing to the Finnish capital, Helsinki. Although the Soviets knew about the Mannerheim Line, they lacked details, and the 7th Army was expected to achieve its goals in three weeks, which was extremely optimistic, even considering that the Ladogan and Baltic fleets were going to assist. This is something that you're going to see continuously in the Winter War, and that is this idea that essentially the Soviets have that this is going to be like a steamrolling, right? Um, the Finns don't have a massive army. They don't have great strategic defenses, although they do. The Soviets think that they don't. And so the thought process is we have overwhelming numbers. Um, they don't have anything. The Finns don't have anything to fight these armored divisions. Um, they don't have any tanks. They're not, they are not equipped like a modern army is going into World War II. Um, however, they beat the brakes off the Russians for a while, so let's, let's keep going. The 8th Army under Kabarov consisted of five infantry divisions and one light-armored brigade, and it was entrusted with a breakthrough to the north of Lake Ladoga. The army would then either drive deep or attack the Finnish defenders of the Karelian Isthmus from the rear. Commanded by Duhanov, the 9th Army had four divisions and an objective to take Kiyani and then Olu, thus cutting Finland in two. In the far north, Frolov's 14th Army consisted of two infantry divisions and one mountain division. Frolov, supported by the Soviet Northern Fleet, was ordered to seize Petsamo, as that would have prevented a possible intervention via Norway or the Barents Sea, and then swing south towards Ravaniemi. In total, the Soviet army had 425,000 soldiers, 3,000 artillery pieces, 2,300 tanks, and 2,500 planes. In comparison to the 24 Soviet divisions, Finland had just 14, and even those were 20% smaller in terms of military personnel, for a total of 265,000 soldiers. The army of the Isthmus was commanded by Ersterman, and consisted of six divisions, with the 3rd Army Corps on his left flank and the 2nd Army Corps on the right. The 4th Army Corps under Heiskanen was located to the north of Laduga and had two divisions, while the North Finland group, led by Tuompo, was made up of the border guards, reservists and former members of the White Guard. The Finns also had just 500 artillery pieces, 26 tanks and 270 planes, yeah, look at those numbers. That is that is so bizarre. So 425,000 troops to 265. So okay, it's almost 2 to 1 there. It is way 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 more than 2 to 1 on everything else. Uh 2300 to 26 tanks. So Essentially, you don't have tanks, you don't have planes, because what are you going to do? You can't use your tanks if they're going to get immediately destroyed and run off the field. You're just, you're just wasting tanks. Same with the airplanes. If you go and try to use your airplanes in a, in a region and you are just completely overwhelmed by the number of, of Soviet planes in the area, well, then you're just throwing planes away. And so... The Finns have to be incredibly, incredibly strategic on how and where they use these smaller resources that they have. They find some pretty brilliant ways to kind of balance the, the imbalance of men and weapons on, you know, on the front. Artillery pieces, 26 tanks and 270 planes which meant that the Soviets had an overwhelming advantage in aerial combat and in open terrain. At the same time, the Finns had a shortage of artillery ammunition and even small arms, which meant that they had no hope to win open battles. 
However, most of the territory that would be initially attacked by the Soviets was impassable for tanks, so they needed a breakthrough to get into the area more suitable for their armour. The Finnish forces were mostly concentrated on the Karelian Isthmus and to the north of Ladoga, with smaller groups in north and central Finland. Those less populated areas were convenient for large-scale guerrilla combat, but on the Isthmus and around Ladoga, the Finns would be forced to fight the Soviets head-on. Despite being heavily propagandized, the Mannerheim line was hardly impassable, as the Finns didn't have enough artillery and bunkers, with its weakest point being near Summa. The line's strongest points were on the Gulf of Finland and Lake Ladoga, as the defenders managed to create effective artillery systems on the nearby islands. Mannerheim expected his army to contain the Soviets for up to six months, after which, he hoped, Finland would be supported by France and the UK. The war started on the morning of the 30th of November with Soviet artillery volleys against the Finnish lines and bombing runs against the nearby cities, leading to civilian casualties. On the Isthmus, the Finnish border was mostly defended by the reservists and border guard belonging to the 11th Division. Although heavily outnumbered, this group was able to hold the Soviet advance for seven days before they retreated behind the Mannerheim line. This stalwart defence gave enough time for other Finnish divisions to take their positions along the line. As the Finns had a more significant concentration of forces on the right flank, the Soviets decided to delay their plans to attack towards Vipuri and continue the advance on their right. Crossing the Voxi River seemed like a great way to split the enemy front, but the Taipale River was a more comfortable crossing, so the Soviet 150th and 49th Divisions were tasked with attacking there. However, this lag allowed the Finnish 10th Division defending there to concentrate more artillery in the area and start shelling the Soviets, leading to severe casualties. The Soviet artillery countervolleyed and their troops began the crossing. Although the Finnish batteries managed to inflict even more damage on the Soviets coming across, and there were counterattacks, by the 12th the Red Army had gained a foothold on the Kokoniemi Peninsula. Here they started waiting for the 49th Armoured Brigade to arrive. At the same time hoping to gain multiple footholds, the Soviets launched an attack on the town of Kivinyemi. As the commander of the 7th Army, Yakovlev, was pressured to make progress as quickly as possible, they attacked as soon as engineer battalions arrived, with no reconnaissance or artillery support. This is something that the Soviets are, at this point, not very good at. They are, you know, it's always joked about how terrible uh, ancient Rome's recon was, and that's the joke, right, is they have to have... Uh, soldiers who are essentially construction workers to put up these great forts while they're in the field because if you're going to be that bad at recon you really need to have protection when you're out in the open this is something that the Soviets show they are woefully unprepared for and that is recon and understanding where you know Finnish troops are where strong points are where artillery is they are constantly, constantly figuring it out as they go, or they'll slam into an area and then be like, oh, th okay, well then this is where this artillery is, this is where these guys are. Um, it's just something that you see over and over again where uh, the Finns have their strategic movement of troops and the Soviets basically play a guessing game of just slamming into places and when they do, they find out who's there. Hundreds of Red Army soldiers died in this failed attack on the night of the 7th of December. Despite that, Yakovlev informed his superiors that he had a foothold and ordered his troops to attack again. His soldiers refused to carry out the order in an unprecedented fashion. On the 8th, Yakovlev was relieved of his duties and replaced by Meritskov himself. Soviet headquarters ordered more troops to join the 7th Army. Meritskov decided that he needed to attack simultaneously along Lake Ladoga and towards Vipuri to put more pressure on the defenders, but that caused even more chaos as the Soviets started moving artillery and armour towards the Gulf of Finland 
and the two small roads in the area weren't nearly enough. This delay was used by the Finns to reinforce and camouflage their positions. So, when the Soviet right flank troops started barraging the enemy, they barely did any damage. On the other hand, Finnish artillery was able to inflict heavy casualties on the Red Army soldiers attacking around the Kokonyemi Peninsula. After each volley, the Finns would move their cannons to a new position, making it impossible for the Soviets to pinpoint their batteries. The Soviets' attempts to make their foothold larger continued until the 25th, but were stopped, losing thousands of troops and almost all of their tanks. However, to the west, Stalin's units managed to gain another foothold by taking Krelia. The Finns were able to bring more troops to the area and started shelling the Soviet foothold. This prevented the Soviets from gaining even more territory to the north of the river, and by the 28th, the remaining Soviet troops were forced to retreat. Thus ended the Battle of Taipale. The Soviets lost more than 10,000 soldiers, while the Finnish casualties were around 2,000. So the Soviets have lost 10,000 men, and if you look at this line, nothing has really changed. I mean, the, the strategic balance here has not really changed. Now, the one thing that is changing is the Finns don't have a ton of shells, they don't have a ton of men, and so when they lose 2,000 men, when they use a lot of these shells, it is much harder for them to replace these losses than what the Soviets have. However, they've already killed 10,000 Soviet soldiers, and there's basically a stalemate here. However, this was just the beginning of the Winter War, and we're planning to talk more about it down the line. Our second channel, The Cold War, deals with modern history, and the link to it is in the description and the top right corner. Make sure you are subscribed. Okay, so this was the first Kings and Generals video, the start of the series, The Winter War. Uh, I will put out the next one within the next couple of days, and I'll keep putting out the Napoleon videos daily, and I'll see you guys then.